Uh, the development and dispersal of the Indo-European languages are variously attributed to the Upper Paleolithic, as we sh shall be hearing a little bit today, the Neolithic, as uh, Renfrew, uh, and the Bronze Age, the Kurgan uh, hypothesis, uh, the last of which is, the, is currently the most favoured by linguists. Identif identifying the point of origin, uh, the Proto-Indo-European homeland, and the timing of the dispersal of Indo-European has depended largely on archaeology, with contributions more recently from genetics. The pace of linguistic change has generally been inferred from this. So how can we tell what language was spoken at a given, at a given time? When contemporary written records are present, it, it's a simple matter, but for prehistoric periods, inferences have usually been made on the basis of continuity and change in material culture, and in recent years on the basis of genetics. These are used in partnership with linguistic analysis that provides information on the division of languages. However, we know as archaeologists that material culture, genetics and language do not necessarily go hand in hand. While it's useful to triangulate changes we observe through archaeology, genetics and linguistics, we have to be very cautious with the cultural historical approach that assumes that they belong rigidly together. The cultural historical approach typical of early 20th century archaeology, that language is correlated with material culture and genetic groups, has been questioned, as has the idea that change is affected by large invasions. It's assumed that we can only determine the language spoken at a given place at a given time in prehistory by inference mat from material culture and genetics. For the period before written records uh, give us linguistic information, uh, linguists have depended on the archaeological record to give some indication on when and where change happened. I hope in this paper to set out a methodology that can be used to identify the language, or languages perhaps, spoken in a given area at a given time in prehistory. Through the study of place names in relation to environmental change and archaeology, we can suggest absolute time frames and locations for language. I shall offer an example from southern Britain, which is believed to have been settled by Germanic groups, the Anglo-Saxons, in the post-Roman period, who brought with them a Germanic language which became Old English. I shall show how place names using Old English elements can be seen to describe environments that only pertained in prehistory. The evidence I will present here, all too briefly I'm afraid, strongly suggests that a Germanic language, a predecessor of Old English, was spoken in parts of Britain before the Roman period, and that it was not brought through Anglo-Saxon invasions in the, in, in the post-Roman period. So this goes further than Daphne Nash Briggs's paper, where she thought that uh, Germanic is isolated and mixes with Britonic. The, the methodology I've got in this study is to analyse landscapes in Eastern Britain that are known to have changed significantly between the prehistoric and the medieval periods. Most place names in the English language, uh, la in, in the English landscape, are made of elements of Old English. The name we give to the language spoken in parts of Britain between the end of the Roman period, conventionally 410 AD, and the Norman Conquest, 1066. After that, it becomes Middle English and then Modern English. If groups of Old English place names indicate a landscape that prevailed in prehistory, then this would suggest that a Germanic language, an ancestor to English, was being spoken. I set out this hypothesis while working on the evolution of settlement and field systems in the landscape of Southwest Britain. There was clearly great continuity in the division and use of the landscape that extended back into later prehistory and some place names seem to be describing the prehistoric land use rather than the medieval. The methodology I used was not original. It had been used before by Professor Charles Thomas uh, back in 1985 to provide a chronology for the inundation of Scilly, the island group off the southwestern tip of Cornwall. Thomas used place names to determine the date that the landscape of the Scilly Isles was drowned dividing it into an archipelago of smaller islands. The technique is effective only for landscapes that have experienced major well of evidence changes. So here he found that the Britonic names um, for coastline, uh, for uh, shoreline and waterline, went only around the outside of the, of the archipelago, 
whereas English names describing shorelines were um, faced inwards. So he could, he could uh, suggest uh, that the inundation had taken place in the late or post roman period. In fact, um, this has since been proven to be wrong, but the, uh, there's been recent environmental uh, uh, work done on the Sillies which has shown it's much, much earlier. But the technique is still an important one. Um, relating landscapes to, uh, to place names, uh, I call toponym environment correlation analysis, um, TECA, um, matching place names to specific environmental situations. Well, like Thomas, I decided to analyse hydronymic terms, in other words, watery place names, in relation to their landscapes. The Old English uh, word for an island, which is pronounced A or E, occurs frequently both in major and minor place names in Britain. I've so far recorded over 400 instances. Names with A elements, uh, let me see if that's the next one, no. um, describe four main types of location. Marine islands like Jersey, Lundy, Orkney, Caldy. Islands in wetlands and levels. Uh, these include large areas of wetlands like the Fens, the Somerset Levels, the Northwest Wetlands, and the Humber Wetlands. There are also a number of isolated wetlands such as Rumley Marsh um, uh, uh, in Kent. Island names with the element uh, include Thorny, Whittlesea, Athelney, lots on the Levels and the Fens. Thirdly, there are riverine islands, for example, Chertsey and Battersea on the Thames. And lastly, islands in Mears. Mear was the old English name for uh, a, what we now call a lake. Related to the uh, um, A names, the island names of the last type, are place names comprising hydronymic elements such as Old English Mear, and Old English Pol, and o Old English Poo, um, meaning pool. Many A and Mere names are found in areas that are now, and usually in the Saxon period too, on dry land. Place name studies uh, are therefore of necessity attributed a wider meaning to the elements. The element Mere is judged to mean also seasonally flooded river valleys or marshland, while A island is deemed to mean also dry ground surrounded by marsh. So in order to, uh, to accommodate this uh, environmental paradox, they've actually adjusted the meanings of what island and lake meant. Um, it can be shown that such, such an extension of meaning is not necessary, since these areas can be shown to have been mirrors or islands in prehistory. It is only the premise that English was not spoken that prevents this interpretation. In order to test the hypothesis that a names were given to islands before the arrival of the Saxons, a test area would have to satisfy the following criteria. The area must contain a number of A place names. The area must have been unquestionably dry since the Roman period. One area that satisfies these criteria, and there are others, is the Upper Thames Valley, where there is a cluster of place names with the A element, including Oaksey, and Ampney, Maisy, Cerny, and Aisy, all island names. That's, this is in the Upper Thames, just to show you the location. And um, a plan of that, uh, of that valley. And the white area there it, uh, shows where a lake must have existed, according to these many place names. In the Western Mere, Oaksey, uh, which is, means Wax Island, Aisy, which is another name for an island, it's a sort of double term. Uh, Mindity, which is Wild Mint Island, appear as islands above the 85 mil, uh, metre contour. Down Ampney, clearly another island name, um, and North and South Cerny, also probably islands, are difficult to locate due to the disruption by recent gravel extraction. In the parish of Mindity is the field name Rye Close. Uh, there's Walkney, which is uh, Fuller's or Wilker's Island. Um, I'll run through a, uh, a, a quick list of them. Just a massive number of, of hydronymic names uh, concentrated here. Fringing the mirror is a series of hydronymic names such as Pool Keynes, Poulton, uh, the field name Nonena Pool, Nuns Pool, and the field name uh, Lamaralis, which means uh, uh, 
which is leased by the Mir. Um, Summerford Keynes, which implies there was a, a ford that was only cross, uh, crossable in the summer uh, when the water wasn't cascading down from the, from the Cotswolds, uh, suggests there was a seasonal fluctu fluctuation in the water level. Sturt, or Stiot, uh, Old English, a projecting piece of land frequently over water, overlooks the mere from the south side, while Cricklade, um, uh, the, the place name uh, uh, scholar Margaret Gelling, says this means, uh, laid means ferry crossing, um, indicates that it's possible to cross the mere by boat at this point. Um, and uh, there's also a name at uh, Wine Shore, which may be uh, bank with a windless windless or a and in the eastern part of the mirror are, th are the islands referred to uh, in the place names Rumsey Meadow, um, uh, an island name, Reedy Farm, the fishery Aot, Aot meaning an island. This mirror is also bordered by hydronyms including Sturts again, Sturt, Mir, Dimmer, Oki, Lechlade, again a ferry crossing, uh, and Bowmore um, meaning Bull Mir. Between the mirrors lies Marston Maisie. Marston is Marsh Farm. Uh, but the Maisie is, uh, is Moss Island. Um, the name may therefore, uh, sorry, which is echoed in the, navy, in the name of the nearby parish, Maisie Hampton. Like the islands referred to by Ampney and Cerny, it has either been destroyed by gravel extraction or is submerged by alluvial and colluvial sediment from the Cotswolds to the north. The concentration and distribution of hydronyms in the area between Oaksey and, uh, and, Cr and, Cr and Cricklade um, strongly suggest the presence at a time in the past of a large body of water some 23 kilometres long. The presence of the Ermine Way, the Roman road from Silchester to Sirencester, crossing obliquely through the centre of the Western Mere, demonstrates that the Mere must have been drained before the 1st century AD. More importantly, it's likely that, that language used in the naming of places around the Mere was an ancestor of Old English. This is part of a wider study of languages in prehistoric Britain, which also involved the study of Roman place names, um, establishing a framework for when certain place name elements were co common, uh, like Beog, which is commonly used for early Bronze Age burial mounds, um, Borach, which uh, is very commonly used for uh, Iron Age hill forts, and Ham and Tun, which appear to be later terms. There are, of course, profound implications of this research on the dating of languages in Britain. My research strongly supports the possibility that a Germanic language was spoken in Eastern Britain as early as the Early Bronze Age, from 2400 BC. And it may well be earlier still. This does not necessarily conflict with the Kurgan hypothesis or with the hypothesis that the Indo-European languages were spread through farming. But it is also possible that a Germanic language was spoken in Britain during the last evident settlement of Britain 12,000 years ago. While the arrival in Britain of a Germanic language can be established from this research as having taken place no later than the second millennium BC, it is not yet possible to determine the period more precisely. It is hoped that the other papers and discussion in this session might throw some light on the most likely chronology. Thank you.